Hey guys, Kyle here, product manager at Presonus, and today we're behind the scenes of the recent River City session featuring Sailor Mouth, and today we're going to talk about the intro and basics of drum production. Once you've moved the drum kit into a spot in the room that sounds good to your ear and you spend some time tuning them, now we'll want to focus on close micing the drum set. For this session, we used a combination of microphones, including mics from our DM7 drum mic kit, alongside some others to support it, and now we'll go take a look. Starting with the kick drum, we've used the PreSonus BD-1 as the kick-in microphone. A kick-in microphone is going to give you a lot of attack from the beater. I specifically have this microphone placed towards the beater for that reason. And since we're able to use two mics on the kick, we combine that with the Solomon Mics Low Freak that is going to give us our low end sound to blend in with the attack of the kick in. Using the kick out in conjunction with a kick in microphone gives us ultimate flexibility when mixing and post production. Moving on to close micing the shells of the kit, we've used the ST4s out of our DM7 drum mic pack for the toms and the snare top. When micing the close mics, we want to take into account the bleed coming off the cymbals, and as all these mics are unidirectional dynamic microphones, they will reject sound coming from the sides and the back of the mics and pick up directionally what's in front of them. So if you're working with a drummer who might be hitting this cymbal very hard and not really hitting these as hard as this and it's becoming to be a bleed problem, you can always take your microphone and take into account that it's going to reject what's happening behind, behind or on the sides of it, you can always just move it over slightly, which may work better for your session and the drummer you're working for, depending. The hi-hat tends to be something that drummers will hit fairly hard. If you're working with a rock drummer who doesn't have a lot of control or just likes to hit things very hard, the hi-hat can easily become something that becomes an issue. It will easily overtake your overheads and can cause a lot of bleed, particularly on the snare drum mic, which normally resides very close to it. So what I like to do is make sure that when I'm placing the snare top mic, that is rejecting as much sound from the hi-hat as possible. You can do this by moving the hi-hat a little bit away. You can place the mic to be facing the opposite side of the hi-hat, but you want to make sure your drummer's comfortable and just working the bounds that you have to work with but those are all things to consider. And the last thing to talk about when talking about the snare drum is we've also included a snare bottom mic and for that we've used the Shure SM57. The snare bottom mic is something that is often overlooked, but adding it in the mix will give you crispness from the snare wires themselves and blending it in slightly can help with dynamics, especially if you're working in a mix where you start gating the snare and doing things like that the snare bottom mic can give you a lot of life. Moving on from close mics, now we'll talk about what we've done to capture the cymbals of the drum set. For overheads, we've used a pair of our PreSonus PM2s. These are great sounding transformerless, small diaphragm condensers that give you a very true to the source sound. And as mentioned before, something to take in mind when miking the cymbals with overheads is the relationship of where the overheads are placed and the hi-hat. The hi-hat can easily overcome your other cymbals, especially if it's being played a lot. So what I tend to do is make sure that my overheads are placed in a way that's not directly over the hi-hat. And to ensure we have a little bit more control if we need it, I've put one of our OH2s from the DM7 mic pack on the hi-hat hi as a spot mic, as we would call it. And these spot mics are not necessary, but when possible, give you more control when miking a drum set and I always tend to like to mic the hi-hat and the ride if possible with their own spot mics. One other thing to consider when placing your overheads is the phase relationship between a source when recording a source with two microphones. So in this case we're using two overheads and they're picking up our whole drum set but we need to pick one source to base our placement around. And what I will typically do is choose the snare drum. The snare drum will typically be the loudest source. And when placing your overheads, you can measure the spacing with really anything you have laying around. It doesn't have to be exact. I like to grab a mic cable and just place it in the center of the snare drum and just roughly measure where my overheads are. And if they're roughly in the same spot, then phase is normally not an issue and we get a nice, clear representation of the drum set. Another thing to consider is 
how high the overheads are from the drum set. If they're closer down to the drum set, it's going to be a more direct sound. You'll get more cymbal in your overheads, and the farther up that you raise the overheads, you'll get more room sound, and you'll get more of the entire drum set, the shells, and not just the cymbals, which tend to overpower things when the mics are closer. Both can be useful. It really depends on what you're going for and what style you're going for. So always experiment and use your ears. So those are a few basic tips that can help you to get a good sound at your source. Now let's go to Studio One and we'll take a look at what we've done in post-production. All right, so we have Studio One open and we have our tracks out. Before talking about mixing or how to get things sounding good, we need to talk about session organization. Organizing your session is not talked about enough. It's so important. I cannot stress how important it is. When I receive tracks or I finish recording myself, I make sure I organize things before I ever take a listen. So the first two steps to do that are to simply name the tracks and to color code them. As you can see, I've already done that. Uh, I chose red for drums, and that's my favorite, but you can go ahead and color it whatever way you'd like. To do that, just double click the name to change the name or left click on the panel on each track to change the color. So you can see that we have our kick mics, followed by our snare mics, followed by our tom mics, and last but not least, our cymbals. Once we're at this stage, it's now time to set up some bus tracks. So to do that, we'll hit F3 to go to the mixer panel. And we're going to want to make sure we have some options set. So we want to make sure keep bus channels to the right is disabled. And we want to make sure input controls in the channel components section is enabled. Now, after we do that, it's time to add the buses. What is a bus track? A bus track is simply a track in Studio One that we can use to route single audio channels into, multiple audio channels into. This has many benefits. You can control the volume of multiple channels with one fader. You can use one plugin to process multiple channels that are feeding into the bus that you're using. So many, many benefits, and it just really helps to keep things organized. So to do that, we're going to go ahead and start with our kick drums. So we have two kick microphones, the kick in and kick out. So we're going to make a bus to combine those two. So we're going to right click and we're going to add add bus channel. And we're going to move it to the left of the kick in and we're going to call it all kick. And I like to color my bus channel slightly different from my tracks just to give me a visual indication of what's a track and what's a bus. So we're going to go ahead and color the bus orange by clicking on the name panel, single left click. And we're going to left click here and route the individual audio channels into the bus. So we want to go here and make sure they're all going to all kick, all the kick mics. Now, I've saved some time and I've already made my buses, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this and I'll show you guys all the buses set up. So we first start with all kick and now we need a snare bus because we have two snare mics. So we have an all snare bus for the snare mics and then we have two tom mics, so we need a tom bus. So we have all toms for the toms and then I've routed all the cymbals to an all cymbal bus which is to the left of the hi-hat. So as you can see, we have all kick, all snare, all toms, all cymbals, and there's one more to add now. So once you add all those and make sure that the snare mics are routed into all snare, tom mics are going to all toms, cymbals are going to all cymbals. Once this is taken care of, we'll add that extra last one, and that would be all drums. And you're going to want to take all the bus tracks and make sure the buses are all routed to all drums. Now, once that's taken care of, that means that we can control the volume of the whole drum track, all the drum track with one fader, which is handy. Um, and it also just makes mixing a lot easier when we have multiple tracks per bus. So... Before I take a listen, I know that there are a few things I need to pan. Basically, these are always set a certain way, and I know I don't even need to listen to it. So I know when I record a stereo pair of overheads and I use a space pair that I want to pan the left overhead all the way to the left and the right overhead all the way to the right. So we'll do that right now. Left to the left, 
right, 100% right. We recorded a hi-hat, and I was a right-handed drummer, and the hi-hat's on the left side, so we'll go hi-hat about 50% left. That's normally where I like it. We recorded two toms, so rack and a floor. When I'm doing a one-up and a one-down, I like to do the rack 50 left, and the floor tom 50 right, when it's a right-hand drummer at least, and uh, that will take care of all of our panning. Now there's one more thing that we need to take care of, uh, some maintenance, and that would be to flip the polarity on the snare bottom mic. So we can go ahead and do that now. I'll illustrate what that sounds like. And what flipping the polarity does is it basically just makes sure that the mics are in phase with each other. When you have a snare top and a snare bottom mic, they're pointing in opposite directions, meaning that they're many times out of phase with each other, and one of them needs the polarity flipped. So I like to normally flip the bottom mic to make sure it's in phase. So let's go to a part with some snare drum. Sounds pretty good. And let's flip the phase on that bottom mic. Oh yeah. Off. Polarity flip on. You can hear you get the body back on the snare and we get a lot of low in and low mids back in when the polarities flip. If something's out of phase, it'll a lot of times lose bottom end, it'll lose body, so that's something to listen for. Um, but now that we've done that, uh, we're at a pretty good spot where we can start um, messing with our levels and start uh, getting our volumes right. Now before we touch EQs or plugins, we wanna make sure that we just volume match everything to the best of our ability. Um, and before we mess with the full drum set, we have two sources that two instruments, two drums that have multiple mics on them, and that would be the snare and the kick. And and the cymbals, but we're gonna focus on snare and kick because these microphones lend to different tones. So for we'll start with snare. So let's go ahead and just single out the snare, and we're going to blend in the snare top and the snare bottom before we mess with the drum kit. We wanna use the snare bottom mic just to add some sizzle and some life and some top end to the snare top mic. Sounds good right here. Off. Yeah, you can see how that snare bottom mic adds a lot of crispiness and a lot of like liveliness to the snare. So once we're done with that, We'll go to our next drum that has two mics on it, and that would be the kick. We have a kick in and a kick out. The kick in is gonna be our attack. And the kick out is going to be all low in. Woo, okay. So that low end can get out of control, so let's start with the down and let's add it in. Okay, that's good right there. Now, everything's panned, we got our snare and our kick mics leveled out, and now it's time to volume set the whole drum set. So let's go ahead and do that. I can hear some weird frequencies in the tom, so let's kill those for now. the toms back in oops I see that we didn't balance our hi-hat to our overhead so let's do that real quick so we're going to solo the cymbal bus and we're going to match the hi-hats and volume to where I would like them to be in relation to the overheads and the goal with a spot mic, uh, a cymbal spot mic, is really to just strengthen what's already there in the overheads and to just give the hi-hat a sense of space uh, that it is on the left side, which is where it was in, this, in the recording. And to just give it a little, have it be felt a little bit more uh, than just heard. So let's see.
very subtle. I just want to hear it peak up on the left side a little bit to give it a sense of space and a little bit more presence. So now that we have everything leveled out, now we can begin processing. Everything sounds pretty good. Uh, we were lucky to have a great drummer in a good room, and it really shows you that if the source tone's good, you really don't have to do much. You can see that there's not many plugins going on in this session, but we'll go ahead and we'll start with the toms because I can hear some things going on in there, and I'll show you guys how we clean it up. So it's the finest part with some toms, but I can also hear when the kick drum's being hit, there's a weird frequency, so... Let's listen to that real quick. And what that is, it's basically the kick drum resonating in the floor tom and it's being picked up by our mic. So we're going to want to make sure we handle that as well as clean up the sound of the toms. So as you can see, there's some pretty aggressive mid cuts and a low end roll off here and this is very typical of toms uh, the mid range on toms tends to be a bit muddy and it's pretty common practice to do a big scoop uh, which will make the tom sound more modern but that's what i was going for in the session and let's go ahead and listen to what this move is doing and what we will do is we'll listen to each bus that we're processing in solo and then we'll listen to it in context of the entire drum set so let's go ahead and hear what this is doing off first and now on. Much better, much more modern, much clearer, not muddy. Um, and let's hear what each move's doing. So let's listen to just the low end roll off first. Here we go. Off. Yeah, it's really tightening up that floor tom, giving us room for our kick and our bass drum, our bass guitar. And let's go ahead and put in those mid cuts. Yeah, you can hear that's that's where all the no, the the junk and the funk is. And we're just gonna take it out. So big cuts there, and this high mid frequency cut is just there to soften up the bleed that's coming through the tom the floor tom mic uh because the ride is very close to it and the cymbal is a little bit harsh coming through so i just wanted to soften up some of that cymbal bleed now let's listen to that all right cool let's listen to it in context of the whole drum set sounds great off Ooh, much better on cool so we got the toms in place and now let's go ahead and move on to our snare drum so let's see so we use some eq and compression nothing crazy nothing much snare already sounds good uh, but we, what we've done is we used a compressor with a slow attack and a fast release. And what this does is it basically makes the attack of the snare drum more apparent and it makes it punchier and hit harder. So what that means is slow attack means the compressor is going to be slow to engage. So it's going to let the transient and the punch of the snare drum through first and then it's going to clamp down and compress. So let's hear what that does. Um, off. On a lot punch here is really making that snare hit. Now for EQ, very basic. I'm just rolling off some low end information, which is basically bleed from the kick drum and boosting a dB and a half at 6k, giving it a little bit of air. Let's see what the EQ is doing on its own. Very basic, not doing much. Let's hear what the comp and the EQ are doing together. Off. On. Sounds great. Okay, let's move on to the kick drum.
So it sounds good. It's just a little boomy. And what I tend to do is anywhere between 40 and 75 hertz, I will roll off the lows in a kick drum. And this just helps to control things and to keep the kick tighter and leaves room in the mix for things like bass guitar and other low frequency instruments. So you can see that I've rolled things off at 65 hertz here. Let's go ahead and listen to that. A lot more controlled. And we also did some low mid cuts and some mid cuts, and that's just going to take the funk and the junk out. So let's listen. Sounds great now. Let's go ahead and listen to in context of the drum, the whole drum kit. Nice, cool. Let's move on to cymbals. Very basic, PM2 sound great, didn't have to do too much. This is standard practice of just cutting the low end out on the cymbal track when we're using a bunch of close mics on a drum kit. The close mics are giving us our body from the shells and the low end from the kick drum, so we don't really need that information in the overheads. And I've also gone ahead and taken out some mids and to get rid of a little bit of the junk and the funk. So let's go ahead and listen to that low cut on the cymbals. And now the mid-cut. Listen for it on the snare drum. You can hear it clear up a bit. Off. On. Off. On. You can hear it's getting rid of that frequency that's droning over the cymbals that kind of like wash you. Sounds great now, cool. And in context of the full drum kit. Subtle, but crucial. And last but not least, now we have some processing going on the bus track, the full all drums bus. So what we're going to do is we're gonna start with a bus compressor. And the goal of using a bus compressor on the whole entire drum bus is to add some glue to the kit. We spent all this time close miking and EQing and making our drums punchy, but what can tend to happen is at some point it, sound, it doesn't sound like a drum kit anymore and everything's a little bit too punchy. So what we can do with the drum bus compressor is glue everything a little bit back into the drum kit and make it sound like one instrument in one cohesive piece of kit and what we'll do to do that is we're using a medium attack and release and we're blending in a percentage of the compressor it's very easy to overdo this so typically i'm blending in anywhere between 25 and 50 percent of the compressor but let's go ahead and listen to what it's doing off on so what you want to listen for is basically the cymbals get a little sweeter, the snare tucks in a little bit ever so slightly into the drums, the room comes out a little bit more, and what I'll do is I will boost the mix up to 100% and you'll hear it exaggerated, and it's easy to overdo this, the snare gets killed a bit when I move it up, but just make sure you're careful with it and you have a goal in mind and you'll be fine, so let's listen to it. Start to back it off. Yeah. I want to back it off until I hear the snare sound natural again, but watch when I turn it off. It's going to sound better with it on. It's going to sound more glued in, but still punchy. Off. On. Awesome. Cool. And last but not least, we have some reverb. So we used a room reverb, we used a, about a half a second length on the reverb, and we're only using about 16%. But what this is doing is it's putting it into the sense of being in a room and making it sound a little bit more, more natural to the way that you would hear drums if you were watching somebody play drums. A lot of times we'll use room mics to make a room sound, but uh, on live sessions such as this one, uh, it's not 
really applicable. It's hard to put the room mics in a room where many musicians are playing just to get drum sounds right. So a lot of times we'll just make a fake room sound with a reverb. So we've done that here and I'll show you what it sounds like off first. Now on. Just a little bit goes a long way. So let's go ahead and let's listen to the compressor and the room reverb on the all drums bus off and then I'll turn it on and you'll see how much these are doing together. Oh yeah. You can see how it really finishes off the sound and really ties everything together. But guys, that was a very quick, brief intro to drum production. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and until next time, bye.